nature, memory, and Vancouver's oldest urban park. And it's uh, it's the uh, oldest park in uh, urban park in Vancouver, uh, and uh, one of the largest and oldest urban parks in Canada. An interview about the environmental history of Stanley Park. I'm Jan Oostuk, and you're listening to episode 39 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the Network in Canadian History and Environment. An urban park offers recreation and green space to residents of and visitors to a town or city. Urban parks have their origin in the expanding industrial cities of Europe in the 19th century. Increasingly, urban elites believed that green spaces were needed in order to escape from the stresses of city life. They also believed that these spaces would be good for the health of industrial laborers. Famous parks such as Bois de Boulogne in Paris, Princess Park in Liverpool, the Vondel Park in Amsterdam, and of course the large parks of London have their origins in the mid-19th century. This was soon copied by the large cities in North America, most notably in New York City with the creation of Central Park. Most of these parks were created from scratch and carefully landscaped. An exception of this is Stanley Park in Vancouver. This forested area was saved from destruction and a naturally occurring vegetation was turned into an urban park. The fascinating history of the creation and development of Vancouver's premier park is the subject of a new book by environmental historian Jean Kirage entitled Inventing Stanley Park – An Environmental History. This book is a landscape biography, environmental history and social history of Vancouver's landmark urban park. It tells the story of how and why this small peninsula escaped industrial or urban development, and how it was subsequently shaped by changing ideas of what parks are for and what they should look like, as well as the perceptions of and attachments to this park that Vancouverites developed over time. To explore Inventing Stanley Park, I caught up with its author, Jean Kirage. So Stanley Park obviously is located in, in Vancouver on the west coast of, uh, of Canada, but most listeners might not be familiar with this park. Can you explain where Stanley Park is and, and when it was created? Sure. So um, as you said, Stanley Park is located on the west coast of Canada in the southwest corner of the province of British Columbia in the city of Vancouver. Uh, and it's on the very furthest western margin of the original city um, and it's a peninsular tip so Vancouver's downtown uh, is on a, a peninsula and then it has a smaller peninsula off the edge of it um, that's almost like an island and uh, that is Stanley Park today and it's uh, it's the uh, oldest park in uh, urban park in Vancouver uh, and uh, one of the largest and oldest urban parks in Canada. So and what when was was it created actually? Oh, so the the park was created uh, by the federal government of Canada in 1887 after the city council sent a petition to the federal government uh, requesting permission to use this peninsula as a public park because uh, prior to uh, the creation of the park, the peninsula had been a government reserve, um, ostensibly uh, left aside for military purposes. And because the federal government of Canada has responsibility over the armed forces, the city council had to request permission from the federal government for permission to use this reserve as a public park, uh, which it has been since 1887. Uh, but the park didn't open for at least a year um, and after that. So the official opening of the park was in September uh, in 1888. But the park or the area of the park, of course, has a much longer history. And that's one of the things I liked about your approach uh, to the history of this, well, semi-natural place. Um, and what I really liked is that you included deep time, you know, going way before uh, the past 200 years. And I think you cannot understand the foundations of the interaction between humans and the natural world if you do not consider where it came from. So can you briefly sketch the development of the natural environment of Vancouver Harbour and English Bay uh, from, say, the melting of the of the ice of the last mm -hmm. ice age and before humans started to change it? 
Yeah, this was something I wanted to do uh, with the book when I first set out on the project. I had looked at a number of different park histories um, for Central Park or Golden Gate Park uh, in the United States. Uh, and then I thought, um, to, to really look at the environment um, of this park, you have to look at uh, not just its human history in terms of its use as a park, but to go way back in time to look at how people used this place before it was a park and what the place was like before people um, had ever even set foot on it. So the geological history of Stanley Park, like I think the geological history of most, most parts of the world, is quite dramatic and quite interesting. Um, the uh, park is, 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 uh, has a glacial history, which is sort of its most recent geological past. Most of what's now Canada uh, was smothered by enormous continental ice sheets during the last period of uh, major glaciation in North America. Uh, and those ice sheets didn't begin to melt until sometime between 13,000 and 11,000 years ago. And as the ice melted... Uh, the land that was beneath it had been uh, pressed down by the sheer weight of the ice. So all of the land where Vancouver is today and where Stanley Park is used to be underwater. So when the ice receded, Stanley Park actually was a submarine environment. Uh, and in fact, uh, it spent uh, more time underwater than it has above. Uh, over succeeding generations, the uh, land rebounded as the ice uh, melted away and the weight of the ice was lifted, and Stanley Park began to emerge from the sea. Uh, and because of the topography of the peninsula, it first emerged from the water as an island, uh, and then eventually uh, came out of the ocean uh, and began to take the uh, current shape that it takes today. Another interesting thing I found when looking at the deeper history of the park is that uh, Vancouverites today think of Stanley Park as this um, a densely forested uh, uh, conifer forest, uh, northwest coast forest. Um, but again, that's that's part of its very recent history. It's only within the last 3,000 to 4,000 years that the park uh, has actually been characterized in that way in terms of its uh, plant cover. Um, and it's gone through succeeding generations of different climates and different plant regimes over time. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, the last uh, three or four thousand years that it started to look like what uh, we might recognize Stanley Park uh, might look like today. So how did humans use this space before it became a park in the late, late 19th century? Well, this is something I think is one of the most interesting things about Stanley Park's history. People use this place in a whole bunch of different ways um, than they did after it became a park. Um, so let's, I mean, begin at the beginning. The first humans to set foot on what would become Stanley Park were the um, uh, uh, original inhabitants of southern British Columbia, the uh, uh, ancestors of the modern Coast Salish people, uh, first inhabited the Lower Mainland uh, about uh, nine to 10,000 years ago. Uh, and the first archaeological evidence, or the oldest archaeological evidence that's been found uh, in Stanley Park, dates back to about 3,200 years before present. Um, but it's very likely that people lived there um, uh, many generations before that. Of course, the first people who set foot on this peninsula that would eventually become a park uh, lived uh, on the peninsula. Uh, there were uh, several uh, settlement sites throughout the peninsula, but in the modern period, there were two villages located on the Stanley Park Peninsula, a smaller village uh, called Chai Thus and uh, a very large village called Woi Woi, uh, where many uh, different uh, Coast Salish families lived in the peninsula. And as people do, they uh, harvested the resources of that uh, place for food, for shelter, for clothing. Um, the park is characterized uh, by its forest, but also by its marine environment. And it was in many ways uh, that combination of forest and shore that drew people there. Um, the first indigenous people to live there used the wood from the forest to build uh, housing and clothing and other aspects of their material culture. And they harvested the resources from the surrounding marine environment uh, for food, um, especially the abundant uh, herring and shellfish that uh, were available in the region. And the archaeological record has captured a little bit of, of some of the resources that, that people use. So we can actually go into the earth, find uh, uh, middens that were left behind uh, as evidence of past human uses. So that was the, the oldest use of the park. And I think uh, the longest use, because, of course, people still live in Stanley Park today. There is a, 
uh, population of uh, homeless people who have continued to live in Stanley Park throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. But beginning in the mid-19th century, Europeans arrived, and they started to use the peninsula in new ways as they colonized this indigenous space. Um, and there were two or three different ways in which Europeans used the peninsula. Uh, the first was that they extracted resources for industrial uh, purposes. Um, uh, the first resource that Europeans um, exploited from this peninsula was coal. Uh, there are uh, relatively thin coal seams that run beneath Stanley Park in some parts of downtown Vancouver that early colonial entrepreneurs sought to uh, exploit. And the second resource that they drew from the peninsula was, was the lumber. Uh, so there were two sawmills uh, established in the 1860s on opposite shores of Burrard Inlet, which is the harbor of Vancouver, uh, and the forest of Stanley Park. Parts of it were harvested uh, for uh, sawmilling activities on the harbor. And then lastly, Europeans uh, settled in the park. So just as the first uh, peoples of the region used the peninsula as a living space, uh, so too did uh, European and Asian colonists who uh, resettled in southwestern British Columbia in the mid-19th century. So what struck me when, when I, I've been to Stanley Park, when I visited it, is the um, yeah the location of it on this peninsula. And it's to me, it seemed a little bit odd that it did not become part of the, um, the industrial development related to the port. Uh, I mean, you were talking about resource extraction, but later on you would expect, you know, port installations to be built there or industry. So how did this space become a park? Well, in, in many ways, it became a park kind of by accident. Um, in 1859, the British government established, uh, or 1858, the British government established a crown colony in British Columbia. And in 1859, a man named Richard Clement Moody was dispatched to create a capital city and to um, survey the land and the resources uh, for subsequent exploitation. And during the course of his surveys, he established a number of reserves, uh, some of which were intended to uh, reserve coal uh, for um, himself and for some of his business partners. Uh, and some of the reserves were uh, set aside for military purposes. It's not entirely clear from the historical record why uh, Moody created a reserve where Stanley Park is today, um, but he did. And by doing that, it prevented uh, colonists from preempting land on that peninsula. Uh, and so when British Columbia joined Canadian Confederation in 1871 and became a part of Canada, all of those reserves were turned over to the federal government. Um, and so throughout that entire colonial history, uh, no settlers had been able to uh, establish homesteads on, uh, on that peninsula. And so it was excluded from uh, industrial development. When the city of Vancouver was created in 1886, uh, a major landowner in the area was the Canadian Pacific Railway Corporation. This was the uh, corporation that created Canada's first transcontinental railway that crossed through the Canadian Northwest and the prairies and eventually reached the Pacific Ocean and its terminus uh, in Vancouver. The Canadian Pacific Railway had hoped to use the Stanley Park Peninsula as a port, but uh, when they discovered that it was in fact a uh, government reserve, uh, they instead uh, hatched this other plan uh, to try and get the city council to use that reserve as a park because they owned all of the land that was directly adjacent to it. And they knew that uh, from previous experience in other cities like New York and San Francisco, they knew that land that surrounded large urban parks tended to uh, increase in value and become uh, very prestigious and elite neighborhoods. And so if they could get this reserve turned into a very large urban park, all of their property next to it uh, would become very valuable. And so <clears throat> the CPR played a very direct role in uh, persuading the city government to petition the federal government of Canada to create a park. But there were also aesthetic reasons, I think, for the creation of Stanley Park. The uh, CPR employee and city councillor who first uh, put forth the idea uh, of creating this park uh, was a man named Lachlan Hamilton. Uh, he was a city councillor on the first city council, but he was also a surveyor for the Canadian Pacific Railway Co uh, Corporation. Uh, and he had a kind of uh, utilitarian outlook on the city of Vancouver. He designed the street network and he was a, an engineer, but he was also an artist. And in the evenings, he would paint the uh, peninsula that would become Stanley Park. And I think that 
represented a kind of appreciation for the landscape. Uh, and so his desire to uh, create this park I think combined both these utilitarian interests in property values as well as an aesthetic appreciation for this uh, beautiful forested landscape. But this forested landscape is not natural. Uh, it was modified by, by humans. So how was it modified over time after it became a park? Well, that's, I think, one of the more uh, uh, unknown things about Stanley Park's history uh, there were people who obviously lived uh, in the park for many uh, hundreds of generations before it became a park. But uh, humans uh, had their greatest impact on the forest of the park after uh, it became a park rather than before. We often think of parks as places where, where, where humans protect nature from disturbance or change. But in fact, in the 19th century, uh, the a part of the process of creating a park involved uh, quite dramatic interventions into nature and transformations of the environment. And Stanley Park's uh, forest was subject to many of those kinds of changes. Um, it uh, experienced fires uh, that broke out. So as park infrastructure was constructed, particularly roadways and trails, the brush that was left along the side of the park uh, could occasionally lead to small fires. And in fact, the summer before the park opened, uh, large fires broke out throughout the park, and that, this actually caused quite a bit of anxiety in the city uh, that they, they were going to open this beautiful new forested park that might burn to the ground before the opening day. Uh, the other major change that occurred began uh, in the uh, 1910s and the 19-teens. Uh, the park board, which was responsible for administering the park and managing the park, uh, discovered that uh, a lot of the trees were beginning to look more ragged and uh, defoliated. And uh, what they found was that there were wide swaths of the peninsula that were infested with various insects and fungus. And so they turned to the Federal Department of Agriculture, uh, which had a, a team of forest entomologists who uh, were hired to travel to British Columbia from Ottawa uh, to study this insect infestation problem to, to try and save the forest of Stanley Park. And uh, they made four major recommendations for how to improve the forest. And that's kind of the way in which park managers thought in the early 20th century, that they were there not just to preserve the forest, but to actually enhance it and improve it. So they recommended that uh, all of the, the dead or dying trees that were infested with insects be removed, uh, chopped down and hauled out of the park. They also argued uh, that the uh, uh, underbrush of the park and any trees that were lying dead on the ground of the park be cleared away. So the forest floor of Stanley Park in the uh, early 20th century actually used to be much more tangled um, and disorderly. Uh, and over uh, several decades, m much of that was cleared away. Uh, the entomologists also made some aesthetic interventions. They suggested that the tops of dead trees, be of, of very large dead trees, be cut off because they knew that uh, Vancouverites and other tourists enjoyed taking photographs next to really large trees. But uh, a lot of those large trees uh, were dying or infested with insects. Uh, and so in order to preserve this, the bases of the trees where you would take a photograph, they would just chop the top off. So you would have a really large base of a tree that you could take a picture next to, but the dead top you couldn't see from a distance. And so this had the effect of smoothing out the tree line of the park. And so over time, that tree line began to look different. And then finally, uh, the entomologist suggested that certain species of trees be eliminated from the forest, particularly spruce and hemlock, uh, because they felt that these trees... Uh, didn't uh, survive very well under park conditions, um, which I think was implying that Stanley Park is about a 1,000 acres and that in that size, those trees didn't thrive and they attracted insects. And so the park board eliminated much of the spruce and hemlock tree cover of the park and replaced it with Douglas fir, which was a kind of lusher, greener, puffier tree. And so when you look at photographs of Stanley Park from the late 19th century, the trees are a lot more uh, heterogeneous, variable, ragged, with dead branches and dead tops and a much denser, disorderly forest cover. But in the 1940s, or by the 1940s, the tree line is much smoother. The trees are a lot puffier. There are far fewer dead trees, 
and the forest floor is is much clearer. Uh, and so there was over uh, several decades in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, and 40s, the forest was transformed almost entirely, such that uh, in the present there are very few old growth trees in Stanley Park. Most of the trees in the park are 20th century trees. So the the, the park became kind of more yeah well park like uh, looking. Uh, so. What happened to the uh, indigenous people that were living in the park until the 19th century? I understand from your book that there were villages uh, in what is now the park. So what happened to these indigenous peoples uh, during the 19th century? Yeah, so the the Coast Salish villages that were on the Stanley Park Peninsula were uh, in law officially displaced in 1876 during the course of a commission that was uh, held by the provincial and federal government. Uh, A group of uh, Indian Reserve Commissioners, three Indian Reserve Commissioners, traveled throughout the province, uh, meeting with uh, Aboriginal people uh, to determine uh, their needs for reserve space in the province. And when the Reserve Commissioners met with the Coast Salish people who lived on the Stanley Park Peninsula in 1876, uh, they determined that uh, the peninsula should have about seven acres reserved for an Indian reserve. Uh, But when they consulted with the provincial government about this, the provincial government of British Columbia said no. Uh, And so no reserve was ever created on the Stanley Park Peninsula, and those families, at least under law, were uh, considered squatters. And so between 1876 uh, and 1888, when Stanley Park opened, uh, many of the Coast Salish families, uh, both Squamish and Musqueam people, uh, dispersed to uh, Indian reserves in other parts of uh, Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. Uh, but some families stayed in the park uh, right up to the 1880s. Um, but as the park board took control of Stanley Park and started to build um, a roadway around the park, the roadway cut directly through uh, the Coast Salish village and, in fact, uh, destroyed some of the property. The road crews destroyed some of the Uh, First Nations property in the park, which eventually drove those remaining families out of Stanley Park. But there was a smaller village located um, uh, at a place called Brockton Point in Stanley Park. And this was a village uh, of about eight families of mixed European and First Nations descent uh, who had lived there for uh, at least a couple of generations since the 1860s. They stayed in Stanley Park right up until uh, the 1920s when the city of Vancouver uh, and the park board uh, um, took, them to, took them to court, uh, initiated formal legal proceedings to uh, dispossess these people from their houses. Uh, the park board considered them to be squatters um, and uh, didn't consider them to be legitimate uh, homesteaders or settlers, uh, even though they had lived there for a couple of generations and had fairly well-established houses in the park. Uh, In 1925, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the uh, families that lived at Brockton Point did not have a legal title to live in the park, uh, and the uh, city of Vancouver eventually uh, physically uh, evicted those families in 1931. But uh, as an interesting piece of trivia, I guess, for Stanley Park history, uh, two people were allowed to actually stay in the park for the rest of their lives, uh, a brother and sister named Agnes and Tim Cummings. Uh, and they lived in a cottage uh, in Stanley Park at Brockton Point uh, until uh, Agnes uh, died in 1956, I believe, and Tim died in 1958. So that's really an interesting piece of social history related to the to the park. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting uh, case because um, it fits, I think, with a lot of other park histories of um, people who find themselves being encircled by the boundaries of a park and then. Uh, uh, being subject to um, expulsion. But in the case of Stanley Park, I don't think that the park board or the city was trying to uh, evict these families to try and create the sense that this was an uninhabited wilderness. Um, There were actually a lot of other people who lived in the park. Uh, Many uh, of the park employees actually lived in Stanley Park. The uh, park superintendent lived in a house in Stanley Park. Uh, There was a caretaker for the uh, municipal water pipeline that ran through Stanley Park, who lived in Stanley Park, and there was a, a, a lighthouse keeper who lived in Stanley Park. I think the reason these families were evicted was that the, uh, the park was intended, at least by the city, to be public space. Uh, 
And because these families had private homes within a public park, it threatened that public space. And there was uh, very literal uh, fears on the part of park commissioners that the um, families of Brockton Point would sell their houses to hotel developers and that uh, a hotel developer would build a, a hotel in Stanley Park. This the eviction of these people. Does this also have something to do with changing ideas of what a public park is for? So, in fact, pointing at changing ideas about uh, urban parks. So, how how was the development of Stanley Park uh, uh, influenced by these ideas? Well, I I, mean, I think that's a good good way to put it, right? I mean, a park is a, a place. It's a physical and um, a physical place with the biotic and abiotic elements to it. But a park is also an idea that people impose on the land. Um, and so in addition to the physical space uh, and the reconstruction of that space to adhere to a kind of vision of what people think a park is, there are also behaviors uh, that are associated with what you're supposed to do in a park. And so part of the process of making Stanley Park was also changing how people use nature on this peninsula. Before 1888, when the park opened, people used this peninsula in a number of different ways. Um, but when it became a park, it uh, homogenized what you could do. It homogenized the uses of nature in that park. And in a, in a sense, the park board limited people's interactions with nature uh, to only non-consumptive uh, recreational or leisurely purposes. That is to say, you couldn't take a resource from the park uh, and, and burn it or eat it or use it in some way where you are taking it for yourself individually. Uh, so you couldn't cut down a tree in the park after uh, 1888. You couldn't uh, hunt animals in the park uh, without the permission of the park board. Uh, you couldn't draw water from uh, a lake in the park. Uh, you couldn't fish. Uh, and these were practices that had been common during the colonial period in uh, southwest British Columbia. And after Stanley Park was created, all of these practices became illegal. Uh, they became illegitimate. And so uh, the rules and regulations and a kind of police authority was applied to construct the behaviors that were associated with using a park. Yeah, so in fact, what they try to do is to uh, completely uh, manage and control the kind of natural environment of the park. But there are, of course, natural forces that still work on the park. And um, in your book, you describe a very interesting uh, you know, incident, a uh, big storm, was it in the early 1970s, where trees were blown over? And there was quite a dramatic response in Vancouver to this. So how do people generally, or have they responded generally to these kind of extreme natural events that affected the park? Yeah, I mean, there there's actually been uh, dozens and dozens of storms that have hit Stanley Park throughout the 20th century. Uh, and this was something I really wanted to know more about when I set out to do the research for this book. Um, I wanted to see the ways in which people change the environment of the park. But I also wanted to underline the point that uh, although the park is, is modified by people, it's also modified by uh, non-human actors as well. Insects, fire, and especially wind. Um in 2006, there was a major windstorm that swept through Vancouver, uh, blew down a, a substantial portion of the trees in Stanley Park, and fundamentally transformed w the appearance of the park, cleared away much of the forest cover. And the response in 2006 was, was quite dramatic. Uh, Vancouverites were um, uh, uh, traveling through the park as if they were mourners at a funeral, uh, and, and they set out to try and reconstruct the forest, to rebuild it, to restore it. And I found, and I knew from my own research, that this has actually happened several times uh, prior to 2006. Uh, in 1962, a major uh, windstorm swept through Stanley Park. This is a remnant of a typhoon named Typhoon Frida, uh, which was uh, a small, uh, innocuous typhoon off of the uh, east coast of Japan that uh, somehow twisted its way uh, eastward and swept up the Pacific coast of North America striking Vancouver in uh, October 1962. Uh, and just like the storm in 2006, it blew down enormous portions of Stanley Park, cleared away much of its forest, thinned out the trees. 
And then I found evidence that another storm had hit the park in 1934, almost the same story, and another one in 1901. And in fact, between 1900 and 1960, there were 19 different windstorms that swept through Stanley Park. So wind throw is actually a really common um, uh, agent of disturbance in the ecology of northwest coast forests uh, in Pacific North America. Uh, and it's part of the ecology uh, of the forest, and it's part of the renewal of the forest. In 1934, when, when a storm hit Stanley Park, there was a major public campaign to replant the forest. And what happened was the park board set out uh, to rebuild the forest to make it look as if the storm had never occurred. And so in 1962, when Typhoon Frida hit Vancouver and hit Stanley Park, people seemed to have forgot that almost 30 years earlier, a very similar event had occurred. But in 1962, there was no public campaign to replant the trees and rebuild the forest because public thinking about parks and about nature had had fundamentally changed in Canada by the 1960s. And instead, there was a, a collective mourning and hand wringing that the park had been irreparably destroyed. And so when the park board set out to restore Stanley Park, uh, they conducted their work in secret uh, and did their best to try and make it look as if the park was rejuvenating on its own. And then in 2006, another storm hit the park. And again, there was a kind of collective amnesia about the regularity of storms uh, almost every generation sweeping through Stanley Park. And so it really started to underline this point for me as I was looking at the history that uh, people's attachments to parks and to place aren't structured by history. I think they're structured more by memory personal experiences and ideas about what we think the history of this place is like, what we remember uh, 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 I um, influences our attachments to place, I think, much more than the environmental histories of those places. Yeah, I think you're totally uh, correct here. I, I found out uh, with my own research into the forests in Scotland that mm -hmm. people are attached to uh, to their memories more than what, what is reality. So if a, a forest is planted, people object to it. But when it's harvested, say, uh, 60 years later, people object to that as well. Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, you know, they totally forgot that there was no forest before it was planted. But when it's removed, they, they don't like it. Uh, yeah, and it becomes an opportunity to understand um, how it is that uh, particular societies uh, grow attached culturally to nature yeah and that's I think where environmental history really comes into this kind of, of research uh, and also I think it points to what environmental history can can highlight in terms of how we view nature or certain societies view nature so what does environmental history as an approach give us in terms of new insights to the history of this uh, particular park well, um, this park, I think, is a piece of a broader North American environmental history about the relationship between North Americans and nature. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, uh, but uh, many of the events that occur in the history of Stanley Park in some ways are samples or a microcosm of um, the interactions between uh, uh, European colonists and indigenous peoples in the colonization of North America. Um, the displacement of indigenous people from their land, the introduction of alien uh, diseases and plants and animals, uh, and the idea and the, the transformation of the idea of wilderness, all of which are, are very broad North American stories played out in the case of Stanley Park. And so I think in some ways you can extrapolate a, some lessons about this relationship between memory and attachment to nature. Um, and I try to make the case in the book that that the, the creation of Stanley Park is very much part of this American or North American story of colonization, um, that our idea of what a pristine environment is uh, or what a valued wilderness is is, is very intimately uh, connected to the history of Europe's colonial expansion into North America, this, this in many ways fallacious idea that there uh, ever was a pristine environment untouched by humans uh, in, in many ways pervades all of our uh, environmental policies and approaches to the environment that limit our ability to think of new ways to live within nature. And instead, as North Americans, we often try and uh, extirpate ourselves from environments as a way to try and rejuvenate um, uh, degraded environments uh, rather than thinking of ways to uh, live in, in a particular environment in a better way.
actually that's is the general story that you see in all settler societies, this, uh, you know, this approach to nature, um, uh, you know, you see it here in Australia, but also in New Zealand. Yeah, that's uh, true. And how, and how to preserve the pristine um, nature that was supposed to be there before Europeans arrived. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, uh, I say this is a, a North American story, but that's certainly the case, I think, in uh, other other. Um, uh, neo Europe's, I guess, as as Alfred Crosby would have put it. So, uh, what is the significance for a story like this for, say, uh, the European context? Because, of course, there are parks in Europe as well. Uh, are there interesting comparisons or, or or differences that come out out of stories like this? Well, we're we're starting to see more uh, attention in terms of comparative environmental history between Europe and North America. Um, a, a Marcus Hall's uh, work on uh, restoration, environmental restoration, uh, takes this kind of approach comparing uh, American and European approaches to restoration to, to look at some of the, the differences. I think uh, where we see some benefit in terms of that kind of comparative approach is it allows us to um, uh, see what aspects of uh, relations with the environment we think of as normative, whatever our particular context is. So for, I think for Canadians, it's, it's quite normative to think of nature preservation in the context of national parks, uh, and wilderness. Um, but when we, when we, uh, look comparatively to Europe, we see a very different history of park creation, um, as well as interaction between, uh, the histories of, of parks in North America and Europe. So there's obviously a, uh, a longer European uh, park tradition, but some of the elements of the North American park tradition, I think, came to influence um, uh, national park creation in France and in Germany and in Italy uh, later in the 20th century. It's an area of environmental history, I think, that there's great potential for further research. So anyone who's interested in, in uh, this area and writing a history of a park, I would say uh, read uh, uh, Sean's book. Uh, <laughs> but also, if you're heading to Vancouver, I think it also makes a very good read to understand Stanley Park and the development of Vancouver itself. And that's very interesting when you're walking around in the city and in the park. So thank you very much for, uh, for talking to me. Thanks a lot, Jan. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Sean Kiraj and me, Jan Oostuk. Normally I host my own podcast, Exploring Environmental History, which you can download from the Environmental History Resources website at www.eh-resources.org. Today I was sitting in for the usual host, Sean Kiraj, to be able to bring you an interview about his new book. Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. For details on artists, please take a look at our show notes at niche-canada.org slash naturespast, where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, and leave comments. Please let us know what you think about the podcast. Don't forget to rate this podcast and write a short review on our iTunes page. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash naturespast. You can always get the latest information on events in the environmental history community from the Niche website at niche-canada.org. And you can find out more about the topics we discussed on this episode on our show notes page. To keep up with current work in the field of environmental history, I encourage listeners to download our iOS app, which works on iPhone, iPod Touch, and the iPad. You can get the app at niche-canada.org slash envhist, that is E-N-V-H-I-S-T. Thank you for listening, and we will be back next month with another episode of Nature's Past.